So uh, we are, we've been in a series called Habits and Hangups, and we're going to be th in this series through the end of this month, through the end of November, I should say the end of November. Uh, and every week we've had someone give a testimony of either um, a habit that they have overcome, an addiction they've overcome, a uh, bad habit, uh, or a good habit that they've started, a good habit uh, relating to, you know, prayer life, relationship with God, this, this sort of thing. And so we have some opportunities in the next few weeks. If you are interested in sharing any sort of testimony about a ha uh, habits and hang-ups, we have some openings. Uh, we have the connection card, which is at your, your, um, at your seat. If you fill that out and turn it in, that's a great way to let us know. We do have a, a specific sermon on money coming up as a habit. Uh, if anyone has a testimony, we're still looking for one for that topic. This would be maybe you've overcome some debt or some bad spending habits or something and you want to give a testimony or just any general um, habits and hangups testimony, we'd love to have you. Um, we have had f several friends from outside of Mosaic come in and give testimonies. Uh, and we have a friend, one of my friends today, Seth, who's volunteered uh, bravely to come in and give his testimony today on habits and hangups. So could you welcome Seth as he comes on up? Seth, thanks for being here with us today. Uh, we, we really are grateful to have you. Uh, I know you've shared your testimony publicly before, but I also know that um, it's, uh, it's still hard to be in a space of people that you don't know and to share uh, candidly as you do and vulnerably as you do. So thank you so much. Uh, go ahead and take it away. I'll give, give you a few minutes to share, and then I'll ask you a couple follow-up questions. Thanks, Noah. Appreciate it. Thank you, beloved, for allowing me to come and share my story. Uh, to me, this is actually an honor to do this because my story is not an easy one. Um, I walk into a room and say that guys who know me, I'm actually infamous. I'm not famous. I don't consider my story something that's celebrated in the sense of where I've been and what I did. So I'll start off by sharing that I grew up in West Michigan. Um, I grew up in Hudsonville, went to a Christian school, grew up in a Christian family, um, <clears throat> but uh, at an early age, I got started looking up images of women, started using those, um, and that, I struggled with multiple things. There's even, there were things I did that I am not proud of, that I, I harmed people um, in that space when I was a teenager. Went to a Christian university, Cedarville College. Um, so I, I have, I have like, Paul always talks about having, you know, he's got his pedigree, you know, I have that pedigree. And in the end, I don't consider it worth anything because it didn't mean anything. I was trying to strive all this stuff on my own. But then I went to Cedarville. I had a moment of, um, of space where I didn't struggle as much because I had a community. And I didn't realize how that was going to be part of the story. But then <clears throat> later on, I went back into it and it got worse. And then I thought, well, I'll get married someday. This will take care of my struggle with looking at images, with using women to try to medicate what was going on in my life. Not that I understood that at the time. And um, so I got married. And I had about a six-month reprieve. Um, and then my wife had to work, so I didn't see her a lot. And then it actually got worse. And it didn't just stay with me looking at images on the internet. Um, I grew up in the generation that we got to explore the internet before everybody else did. I'm 46 years old, so, you know, and it, it got worse. And uh, then, then it went from being in that space to when my wife was pregnant with our second child, I stepped out of our marriage. I used women that were believed that the only option they had was to be a prostitute. And so, I, I lived in that space for eight years, hating myself. Every day, every time I say, swear it off, I say, this is the last time I'm gonna do this. I have a beautiful wife at home, why am I doing this? And the next thing I know, I was right back into it. And then in 2014, the roof collapsed in my, our home from snow. If you remember 2014 here in Grand Rapids area, that was one of the worst snowfalls we've had in memory, second highest snowfall. On February 17th, the roof collapsed in my house. So over the next course of the next year, my family ended up moving six times in one year, ended up going into fighting a lawsuit with their insurance company because they didn't want to fix our home. They wanted just to leave us. We, and in that time, I remember we were living in a cottage that the insurance company was paying, and I'm like, 
we're going through stress after stress and I'm struggling in my addiction and I'm like God where the F are you and actually sitting right here right now he said because I was thinking through this he's like you remember when you said that to me he goes I was right there I had my hand on your right shoulder and I'm like you were weren't you but I didn't know it at the time where he was because I was so stuck, so blind and so caught up in where I was in pain and using something to deaden the pain. But it didn't just deaden the pain, it deadened everything. In this midst of this, I didn't realize that as much as I wanted to die, my wife was waiting for me to die because she was miserable. She couldn't stand the man I was, how I was acting, how I was treating her, how I was treating the kids. Because anger was always there. It was just a moment and a breath away. Because I was angry with myself, and the only way I knew how to deal with it was with my shame was contempt for myself and contempt for others. My acting out was contempt for myself. I didn't care about the people I was with, and I didn't want them to care about me because I didn't think I was worth it. And then in August of 2014, my wife finally asked me again, and this I say again because she asked me multiple times, have you ever been with a prostitute? And this time, I could share partial truth. Yes, but it was only this. And it was only so many times. And we went through a season where I got separated. I lost everything. I thought I lost everything in my life. And then because I was at the very bottom and I had nowhere to go. I was like, all right, Jesus, where are you? I got the help I needed. I learned that I needed community, that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, but it's community. So I did everything I, I, that I was supposed to do. I had people who spoke into my life. I got into counseling. I got into groups. I got into everything I needed to do and just said, all right, Jesus, you show me what I need to do. And Jesus started showing up in my life. He started showing me where he was at and all the pain I was in. And I realized all the pain I was in because I'm a one in six men that they talk about in the statistics. I'd been sexually abused as a child and didn't remember. I started was able to unpack the abuse I had suffered. I started was able to unpack when I was acting out. And Jesus was like, do you remember when you were in that room with that woman? And he showed me, he's standing at the side of the bed crying. He's like, I'm right here. Come to me with your pain. You don't need to go to her. And so that's what I did. And he helped me unpack all the trauma, all the pain, all the suffering, all the religious abuse. I'd also suffered growing up in the Baptist church. And because as much as those people wanted to serve Jesus, they didn't understand some concepts about how Jesus is with us, that we don't have to be performing monkey, monkeys for him. He wants our hearts. He's not looking for sacrifices, he's looking for us. When he has us, then we actually are off, able to offer ourselves as a sacrifice to him. And it's a joy and it's a privilege, it's a pleasure, and it's not hard. And so since that journey, I've been helping others do the same thing, because that's what he's called me into. That's why I'm here today. So thank you for allowing me to share, Noah. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, so my first question is, someone could be sitting here listening and going, why would you share that publicly? You know, like someone might think, I've done some, I've done some embarrassing things or some shameful things. I would never share that publicly. And, and you just shared you know, a, a pretty big story. Why, why would you share that? Why are, why are you sharing this? Well, <clears throat> one reason is, is because literally I was driving up Hall down the road here, you know, just up Hall, going up the big hill, heading towards Eastern. And I was just, everything came in shock. My brother had just found out. I heard there was all these rumors in the town I grew up about what I'd done. Only one thing was true out of all the rumors. I remember Jesus telling me, he said, Seth, your reputation is my reputation. Not that my reputation plays a role on him. No, he was giving me his reputation. So I have his reputation. So I'm not sitting here in a space of shame. I'm sitting here in a space where I know that my reputation has been given to me by Jesus Christ. I am defined by him and no one else. 
And so I can sit behind, in this, behind this microphone, share my story, and say, what I did does not define me. Jesus does. And what advice would you give someone who's struggling with any addiction uh, slash bad habit and they're, they're just in it alone? They're where you were in that space of maybe hating themselves, maybe feeling bad about what they're doing, but just they keep going back to it, they keep going back to it, and that cycle just keeps repeating. What advice would you give them? Share with someone who you know will love you, who you feel safe. I know Noah's one of those people. You know, Noah and I do life. We talk on the phone. We share. He knows my story. I know his. Like, there's others in this room I know who you could share it with. But share it with someone. Don't live in the darkness. Deeds done in the darkness are dark. But when those deeds are done, and then you share them, and you expose them to the light, God makes them light. I'm standing here today because God has taken my deeds. Jesus has made my deeds light. He has shined the light on them. They become light. I share my story. People will go, what? I'm like, yes, it's Jesus. He does that. I remember reading that, and I think it was um, Ephesians 5, I think 12 and 13. It was that, that I'm kind of you know, paraphrasing that verse. And I was in shock. How does that happen? How does that happen? But Jesus does it. By the way, I'm still married. My wife and I are in a better relationship than we've ever been. 22 years we cel- we'll be celebrating this coming year. If I, if I can stand here and t- share this with you and tell you Jesus can change you, he can change you. I know he can. That's why I'm sharing this. Thank you, Seth. You're welcome. Thanks, Noah. Amen. I, I love hearing these stories of grace. Um, we each, those of us that are, that are believers, we have, each have a story of grace. And Jesus gets the glory when we share them. You don't have to share them up here in front of a, on a microphone, but share with somebody. Don't, don't live your life alone. Don't act like you got to fix every problem you have. Uh, you can't. That's Satan's lie and his deception. If you get anything out of this sermon series, uh, it's that you can't fix it alone and that it is good and healthy to reach out to help for help. And, and that's how we experience grace. And we want to experience more and more grace. So uh, we're going to transition into uh, our discussion question time. We always like to do this before our uh, or at the beginning of our sermon. Uh, a couple discussion questions that get you thinking. Uh, about the the sermon that's coming up. So these are purposely asked in third person. We're not asking you to share about your personal story here, Uh, but just how have you seen addictions harm the lives of your friends and family? Again, you don't even have to share specifically. You don't have to, you know, name names or anything like that, but just how have you seen, if you're comfortable sharing, if not, don't, just don't share, totally fine. Uh, Number two, what's your number one piece of advice to someone struggling with an addiction? And I, I like that question because it's helpful when we hear other people share their advice because um, it's stuff we can start applying to our own lives. So if somebody came to you and they said, I'm in an addiction, you might be in one too, but they don't know that. Um, someone's, a friend comes to you and says, I'm in this addiction. It could be um, anything along the spectrum. What advice, uh, what advice would you give them? Please be sensitive, understanding that um, there's people in your group struggling with addictions. And so um, if you have anything judgmental to say, uh, just don't share that. (laughs) So, all right, you got five minutes. Go back to the groups you were in before, and then we'll jump back into the sermon. So up to this point in the series, we've we've been in the series now for, I'm not sure how many weeks, six, seven weeks or so, maybe three, uh, maybe four, five weeks. And we've been talking about the underlying issues a lot uh, underneath addiction. So the roots of addictions, and that's really, really important. And, and uh, we've talked last week about we have this crater inside of us, and we're, we're looking to get that crater filled up with validation. And there's a path where Jesus is the only one who can truly fill up that crater. So I don't really have time to catch us up on that whole message this morning. I do encourage you, if you've missed those weeks, um, look up. Uh, we're at Mosaic Church of Grand Rapids on YouTube and on a podcast app, and to catch up on the sermons that you missed. Um, 
in this series because today I want to shift gears a little bit today and I want to talk about some specifics. And the reason I want to talk about some specifics, some specific addictions, we're going to try to hit uh, some of the, um, on our, our logo here, um, we have all these little icons around and you're like, I wonder if he's ever going to talk about marijuana. I wonder if he's ever going to talk about video games. We're going to try to hit some of those today. Um, and the reason that I think it's important that we talk about some specifics is because we need to be challenged. Like uh, it could, if we just talk in sort of the generalities or even the root level issues, which are the most important, it sometimes allows us to rationalize some of our own actions and, and behaviors. Uh, and um, there's people that are struggling and you aren't going to struggle with everything I talk about today. You may not struggle with any of the things I talk about today, uh, but the person next to you might be, or the person watching online uh, might be. And so it's just important pastorally that we do at some point address some of these specific things uh, in church. Now, the answer is not willpower, right? So as we talk through these things, the answer is not willpower. The principles we've been talking about this whole series are the same. And I've just kind of summarized some of those principles on the screen. For all of these issues, the principles are reach out for help, number one, just like Seth said at the end. Number two, Jesus needs to fill your deepest longings. We did a sermon on that last week. Number three, surround yourself with Christian community who can support you. Uh, The people you surround yourself with are going to dictate your habits. Uh, But um, know that there are addictions and habits that are tearing people's lives apart. And as I counsel people and as I counsel new Christians, sometimes we need to simply hear that certain behaviors are sin. And and, and for new Christians, they sometimes don't even know that. Or if you've never heard it, you never know it. Uh, And sometimes when people want to get baptized, they accept Christ and want to get baptized. Um, It can be uh, it, it can be hard to address some of these things because you're, you're receiving Jesus' grace into your life. And look, this isn't going to happen overnight. You don't have to have perfection in these areas. But, they're, but they're, we're making Jesus Lord of our life, right? And so when we do that, we're saying we're, he's our king. We're not our king anymore. We want to learn to live under his, his directives, the, the, the way he wants us to live our lives. Um, and I would say a, a minimum for Christians is th- whether you're a new Christian that just got baptized or you've been a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years, a minimum for Christians is we have to have a desire to change, a desire to get help. I mean, there's lots of Bible verses I don't have time to get to today, but they're kind of scary. Like if, if you claim Jesus, but you have, you, you're like, I'm totally cool with my sin. I have no desire to change. I have no desire to get help. There's a heart problem there uh, that that really, really needs to be addressed ASAP. So um, we're going to start with alcohol and put put our little icon up here uh, from our from our our sermon graphic. Um, In short, the Bible does not say it's a sin uh, to drink alcohol. Uh, And and you may have grown up in a church that said that. It's just not in the Bible. It's nowhere in there. And I think it's really important that we don't add to the Bible. We don't take away from the Bible. Uh, The Bible does not say it's a sin to drink alcohol. It does say it's a sin uh, to get drunk. And it says both of these things multiple times. Again, we're just condensing this down uh, for this for this sermon today. Um, I have up here on the left one of the passages that tells us it's a sin to get drunk. It's Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk on wine or on anything else. Wine was would have been the common drink of the day in the first century, uh, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And on the other side of the screen, I have a passage from Psalms that actually talks about wine being a good thing. It's in the Bible. It says, uh, He, God, makes grass grow for the cattle and plants uh, for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. So it's just important that we understand if you were brought up in an uh, uh, environment that said it's, it's always wrong to drink alcohol, that that's just not in the Bible. Now, if you've made a decision in your life to never drink alcohol, I think there's very good reasons to make that decision in your life. And I want to I wanna affirm you know, that decision if you've made that for you and for your family. Uh, for some, I think the answer is no alcohol ever. I know a friend of mine, his dad was an alcoholic, and he's just like, I am never going to touch alcohol, 
I'm never going to drink it. I'm never going to touch it. That is totally fine. For him, the only connotation he has with alcohol is this destructive substance that took over his dad's life and completely destroyed his childhood and his family. And, and so, um, and, and for others, there's a history of alcoholism in their families. Uh, and, and that is a, a, a really, and in fact, if we all made that decision in our culture, I think culture would be a better place. We'll, we'll get to that point. Um, but one thing we just need to understand is that um, that's not the answer for everyone. So it's not a sin to drink. It's not a sin to have a drink. It's not a sin to drink. Uh, but getting drunk is a sin for everyone every time, right? And, and there's lots of passages that will talk about that in the Bible. I want, if you have arguments against that, I want you to think about negative things that drunkenness has added to your life for you or for others in your life. Just, I'm not going to have you share, but just think about that for a moment or those watching on, on the screen. Because I, as a pastor, I, I'll talk to people about these horrible things happening in their life and in the middle of the story or the end of the story, and this person was drunk, or and I was drunk, or and we were drunk. And the amount of violence, the amount of recklessness, the amount of sexual abuse that happens because of drunkenness um, is, 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 is a lot. It's a lot. So um, it, w- when, we, when we frame it that way, we see clearly why drunkenness uh, would be considered a sin in, in the Bible. So this is a, a, a list of guidelines. This is not from the conservative Baptist church website, uh, legalisticchurches.com. Uh, this is from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. That's the name of the institute. This is their low-risk drinking guidelines. So uh, zero uh, they say sometimes zero drinks is the only low-risk option. So use this guideline when you're driving, using machinery, cleaning a weapon, pregnant, on duty, on certain medications, and I added uh, if you have an alcohol addiction. One, consume no more than one standard drink per hour. When they say uh, standard drink, this is their, this is their um, chart for that. You can just kind of get an idea. Uh, one drink is one drink. It's just one serving of a drink, depending on how much alcohol uh, is in that drink. So they have this one, two, three sort of way of remembering when you've gone over that, you're drinking too much. You're, what, what happens is your brain starts to change and your liver can't process what you're drinking when you go over these limits. So consume no more than one standard drink per hour. So if you're going to have some drinks, you can have one drink per hour. That's as much as your body can process. Uh, two, consume no more than two standard drinks per occasion. So that would be per day. We're going to have people over. We're going to watch a game. We're going to this. Um, I can have one drink per hour, but no more than two for the whole occasion. Uh, and then three, never exceed three standard drinks per occasion. I think two and three are sort of similar. Uh, but from what I gathered, it was if you, ha- if you were to have three drinks on an occasion, and let's say you drank two drinks every day, the next day you'd have to have one drink um, kind of for your body to be able to you know, process. But you get the idea. The idea is um, your body can only process so much at a time. And so if you regularly are drinking uh, more than two drinks, on an occasion. See, here's the thing about alcohol, and we're going to get to this. I have some slides on this, but it is so celebrated and accepted in our culture. It's this really interesting thing where everybody loves alcohol. Everybody drinks all the time. All the ads are for drinking more and more and more and more. This is like the key to life is drink, 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 drink. This is the key to fun, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, And I know people, and I'm pastoring people, I'm shepherding people, and that's just what they do as their normal existence. They just get sloshed with their friends. And sometimes it's in a party. Sometimes it's on the porch. They don't have normal interaction with each other that's outside of being totally buzzed out to exist, right? We're going to talk about some of the reasons why, uh, of, of why that is. But then we have alcoholism, and we have the abuse that comes with it, and the DUIs, and the deaths, and the total destruction. And we often don't have a middle ground to say, hey, maybe you're drinking too much, right? And if I were to say you're drinking too much, I sound like I'm being really judgy or legalistic or judgmental. So here's a guide that if you're drinking more than two drinks per occasion, you're drinking too much. And if that continues, you're, you're, on, 
you're on a path of being an alcoholic. Like you're on that path. So there needs to be a spot where we go, oh, maybe I need to change my drinking habits uh, as a Christian um, so that I don't fall into the, the, the pattern of alcoholism. Because we act like we can control it, uh, but isn't that the same way with every addiction? Oh, I'll stop. I can stop. I can stop. Right. Okay. So something pastoral to reflect on. Um, I, I have a picture here on the top left, a uh, Major League Baseball game, somebody holding out their beer. And I love baseball. I love the Cincinnati Reds. They're really bad. You might, you might, you might say you need two drinks per game just to be able to watch the Reds. Um, my question is, whether it's baseball or over here, some people at a bowling alley drinking beer, it is, let me say this, it's fine if you want to drink beer at a baseball game. It's fine if you want to drink beer at a bowling alley. But start thinking about your life. Why do you need to have alcohol added to every activity you do to be able to enjoy that activity? I'll be at wherever something with my wife, and I don't even know what we'll be at, just some random thing, and I'm like, why do we need alcohol? You go into a movie. Here's another example. Celebration adds alcohol. It's fine if you want to have alcohol while you, drink, while you watch a movie. But why do you need alcohol to watch a movie? If literally, it's like, you can't, we can't, we're at a point in a culture where it's almost like we can't function without alcohol on, on things that, that, you know, you should be okay. And the other thing um, about these is that beer at this Major League Baseball game, anyone been to a Tigers game? You get the beer, the beer prices? What, it's literally like $15 for a beer at a Major League Baseball game. So if you want to spend $15 on a beer and you've got that in your budget, your Dave Ramsey budget, you know, that's fine. But let me tell you this, beer and alcohol and wine are very, very expensive. And we prioritize our priorities based on what we spend money on. And again, I'm a pastor. I know the ins and outs of people's lives. I'm trying to get people out of addictive behavior and out of really behavior that's damaging and destroying their lives. People are in debt. People are in debt. But instead of paying off their debt, guess what we're doing? We're buying alcohol. People say to a pastor, I can't give to the church, can't tithe. I'm a Christian, I'm commanded to tithe, I'm commanded to give, can't do it. But I can buy $15 beers at the Tigers game, regular, on the regular, right? Like, because this is a part of my life. Now, um, if you want to have beer, that's fine. And you might be like, did he just say that? Yeah, I did. Are you in debt? Are you tithing? If you're not, if you're in debt and if you're not tithing, maybe you should hold off on the beer budget until your priorities are in order, right, to be able to actually afford that. Uh, but, but let's be honest. I mean, how many people do I know that are in legitimate poverty that cannot afford their rent, that cannot buy food for themselves and their family, that often come to me as pastor for money to do those things, and yet they got beer every single night, every single weekend, because they need it to survive, right? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that too. The last one here is just a random Google Images commercial for Corona. Um, Have you ever noticed in beer commercials, everybody is always so happy or so cool? And I just want to say this. um, It's just beer. It's just beer. I mean, it's not that good. It's fine. Like, look, I have beer at my house. If you come over, I may offer you one. It's not that big of a deal, though. We've, we worship it. We're, it's just beer. It's just beer, okay? So we need to get, we'll, we'll get to that. We're being lied to. We're being lied to. So a, a passage I like when it comes to addiction uh, is, the th- is from John 10.10. 10. It says, the thief, speaking of Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus is the I. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I think this is the real appeal of beer. And we're going to put marijuana into this vein as well. Heavy, regular marijuana, uh, sorry, heavy, regular alcohol use and marijuana use, they numb life, right? They numb our pain. And I understand people are going through real pain and there's real brokenness in life. And so when I drink and when I smoke, I feel numb. So I don't feel that pain. And that's, this is the cycle of addiction. Because when I feel numb, I, I don't feel the pain. So let's say I had a big gash in my arm and I was bleeding and I can either go get that wound treated, I can go to a hospital and maybe get some, something in there that's going to sting and I'm not going to like it and it's going to be painful. Maybe I even have to have surgery. I don't want the surgery. It's a lot of pain. So I avoid the pain of the wound by numbing the wound. So now I can't feel anything on my arm and I feel like the problem is solved. I've numbed out my pain. 
And then the problem with this is then my arms gets caught on fire because it's numb and I have no idea that it's on fire and things in my life are starting to fall apart. But um, as long as I'm drunk or high, there's no need to address the issue. So it becomes a cycle where uh, my top priority is to keep the arm numb, not to actually address what's going on. What I observe in people's lives that are chronically drinking, chronically smoking marijuana as their crutch to numb life is children become more alienated, children become neglected, people lose their jobs, people can't show up to work on time, don't have money to pay for groceries or rent, there's constant conflict, there's abuse, there's, there's drug dealer situations, there's, there's fighting going on, but it's okay because I'm numb. I'm numb and so it's okay. Not okay. <laughs> All that stuff's on fire. But as long as I get more numb, then it's okay. But all those things add to the pain. So all of those things that are broken because of my addiction are causing more pain. So what's the solution? More numb. And so then there's more pain and then there's more numb. And so then we create, what we do next is we create a culture of numb. And in this culture of numbness, this just becomes the way we deal with our pain. And God has called us to a, a, a greater sense of freedom uh, than that. Um, let me say a couple things. Legit medical marijuana is fine. People need that as a drug treatment for illnesses in a legitimate way. Uh, the decriminalization of it uh, in, in many, in many uh, ways is good in the sense that it is, this is a mental, emotional, spiritual health issue. Uh, and it requires mental, emotional, spiritual health solutions. It also has um, vastly affected throughout our history uh, a very unequal way of incarcerating people of color. Uh, if you look at sentencing, people will get sentenced to years in prison because of uh, marijuana use, uh, primarily if they're black or brown, not if they're white. It's actually interesting. If you look back at the hippie movement, you're like, why didn't all those white hippies end up in prison for 20 years for <laughs> all the drugs they did? But the, the black you know, users and dealers did, and it just completely ruined families and neighborhoods. So uh, we need to keep all that in mind as, as we talk about that. But for Christ followers, we're talking about going to something to numb our pain rather than going to Jesus and seeing this numbing agent um, take over, take over our culture, take over our world and say we have something better to offer. So if you're a follower of Christ, number one, when it comes to alcohol, when it comes to substance use and abuse, we have to first repent of sin. We have to make Jesus Lord. We have to turn to him for our pain relief. We have to get help, and we have to surround ourselves with supportive uh, Christ followers. Uh, another passage I find really helpful, we've talked about this when we've talked about sex uh, in 1 Corinthians 6. It begins with this phrase, I have the right to do anything, you say. That's the quote. But then, but then scripture says, not everything's beneficial. The quote is, I have the right to do anything. But then scripture says, I will not be mastered by anything. So this is a helpful framework for addiction. Uh, addiction is not beneficial. And addiction is being mastered by something. So when something starts to master you, you need to be aware of that. And you need to know I need to get help because this thing is mastering me. I can't control it. I keep saying I can stop and I can't stop it. There's also an analogy here of a master of a slavery analogy. If you've ever struggled with an addiction, you know it's like a slave master. It's pushing you to do things you don't want to do. So I pulled these verses out of Romans 6, 15 to 23. It's a really fascinating passage. Uh, but it says, you used to be slaves to sin. You used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity, to ever-increasing wickedness. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now you have been set free from sin. You've become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. If you go back to verse 16, it says we actually are choosing who our master is going to be. We're going to sin or to God, and we're, uh, we're choosing 
one master or the other. And the point is, sin is a brutal slave master. And the point is, God is a good master and Lord and shepherd who loves you. But there is a point in here that we are putting ourselves under his rule and reign and saying as Christians, we have the desire to obey him. We have the desire to obey him. And when we are not able to, we're going to reach out and we are going uh, to get help. Um, I'm going to, um, I have a couple more pieces of this uh, sermon that I'm going to hold off for a future week um, because we have, we have the, uh, we have the ability to do it. So, Um, we're going to hit on a few more pieces around the sermon graphic uh, in future weeks. Uh, So let's pause here, and I want us to think about um, this piece. I want us to think about in our lives, now I've just touched on a few addictions today, uh, alcohol, marijuana, uh, numbing, things we go to to numb. There's a lot more things we go to to numb. Uh, video game addiction is one, you know, we'll talk about in future weeks, social media addiction. There's things we go to to numb. And if we're really honest, um, we all have these coping mechanisms for when we're in pain. And uh, many of them are just seem normal, socially acceptable sort of things. What I want us to do during this time, we're going to have uh, LaRonda come back up. We're going to take communion together. And as we come to the table, as we come to the communion table to receive the body and the blood of Jesus, I want us to be able to receive Jesus. I want us to be able to pray. Even in this, in this moment, as we give you a time to reflect, I want us to be able to go to Jesus and ask him what steps he's asking us to make to make him be our coping mechanism. Where we can go to Jesus in our pain, not Jesus alone, but Jesus and his church. So Jesus and your small group, Jesus and Mosaic, Jesus and somebody you can talk to one-on-one, Jesus and someone on our leadership team or one of our pastors, that you, you can change your coping mechanism path from what you've been going to, to saying, and I need Jesus to be what fills me up. I love communion because we're literally eating and drinking. We're literally being filled up with Jesus. And that's what he wants for us all throughout our week. So uh, communion is for Christians. It's for those that are followers of Jesus. Uh, We have two ways of taking communion here at Mosaic. One uh, will be over in this open area over here. Uh, Lucero and I will be over there with uh, a plate of bread and a bowl of grape juice. You'll take a piece of bread, which is Jesus' body broken for you, and you'll dunk it into the bowl of grape juice, which on the night before he died, he held up a loaf of bread, he held up a glass of wine, and he said, this is my body broken for you. This is this glass of wine. It's the new covenant in my blood, the new marriage that I have with you. This is how our sins are forgiven because he died on the cross for our sins. And then we remember him during communion. So remember all that he's done for you, but also remember that he wants you to go to him to be filled. He wants you to go to him, not to your old coping mechanisms, and ask him what that needs to look like in your life. Let's just take a moment, um, and I'll pray over you, and I really want you to think about, I want you to ask God what that looks like for you in your life. Lord, we... We thank you for this moment we have to ask you what it looks like to come to you in those moments where we're going to our coping mechanisms to numb out our pain. And we are in pain. And Jesus, that you would show us uh, the path you have for us, for our pain to be treated, our pain to be healed. God, give us the courage to reach out for help of of how to create that path in our life. And as we come to the table to be filled up by you, Jesus, that we would practice this every day, every night, to be filled up by you, not by anything else, not by any coping mechanism. We thank you, Jesus, that you, your grace is always enough for us to fill us up. Thank you for loving us. Amen.